Hello and welcome to my course on search engine optimization. My name is Peter Kent and I'm going to teach you about SEO, everything you need to know to successfully promote your website in the free or organic search results of the major search engines. Why me? I've been involved in SEO a long time, since around the turn of the century in fact. I wrote a best-selling book about the subject, Search Engine Optimization for Dummies. I've written six editions of this book since 2004, read by hundreds of thousands of people in a variety of languages. And I've helped literally hundreds of companies, large and small, with improving their SEO, including Amazon, Zillow, and Lonely Planet. But my online experience is broader than just SEO. I've actually been writing about working and doing business online for more than two decades. It's easy to find information about SEO. Just Google it and the fire hose will turn on. You'll be flooded with so much information, much of it confusing and even misleading or completely wrong that you won't know where to start. It's hard to find common sense, down to earth information provided in an easy to understand format. That's what this course is all about. My goal is to cut through the nonsense and misinformation about SEO. And believe me, there's plenty of that out there. I'll help you learn the things that really matter in this subject. In fact, in many ways, SEO is easy once you know the secrets. Once you understand a few basic rules about how to create web pages, for instance, it becomes second nature. Each time you create a new page, you'll follow the same basic rules. Coding pages for SEO does not have to be hugely complicated. However, there is a lot to know. Most of what's involved in SEO is about making the right decisions, about using the right technology, for instance, and avoiding things that don't work well in the search engines, about getting links pointing to your site, for example, but understanding what kind of links help you and which kinds don't. It's true that there is a lot to learn, but the good news is, once you understand the rules, the actual work is often quite straightforward. So thanks for joining me, and let's get started. The sooner we begin, the sooner your website will start ranking well in the major search engines. In this course, I'm going to teach you everything you need to know in order to do well in the search engines, from picking keywords to using structured data markup, from understanding how to use links to working with the webmaster consoles. In a broad sense, there are essentially six variables to consider. First, you must understand keywords the search terms people enter into the search box when looking for something in the major search engines. Keywords connect people to your site. Use the wrong keywords and you won't reach the right people. Then there's content, the stuff on your website. This generally means text, though we'll also be discussing images and video. This text has to contain the right keywords in order to convince the search engines that your pages are a good match for those keywords. You need to know what kind of content is helpful and how much, and how it should be formatted to be readable by the search engines. You may have heard the term, content is king. I'll be explaining why this phrase is complete nonsense, yet at the same time, content is incredibly important. Then there's optimization, and this is related to just how and where you place your keywords into the content the kind of coding you'll use for the content, and so on. You want the search engines to find the right keywords in the right kind of content in the right places and within the right coding. Next, submissions. How do you submit your site to the search engines so they index the site? No, you won't be using one of those pay us 100 bucks to submit your site to a thousand search engine scams. These days, submissions is all about making sure you have links so that the search engines can find your site and submitting an XML sitemap through the search engine webmaster consoles. Don't worry, you'll learn all the details in this course. Then there's links. Links pointing to your site and even between pages within your site are incredibly important. Without the right kind of links, it's simply impossible to compete in the search engines in competitive areas. I'll explain what makes a good link, the various different ways that links help you, and how to get them. 
Finally, there's time. There's a concept sometimes known as the Google sandbox or an aging delay. The idea is that new websites get poorer rankings in the search engines for a while after they first launch. This concept is greatly overrated. I wouldn't worry too much about it and I'm not going to spend much time discussing this. I've seen brand new websites rank really well very quickly. While there probably is some greater weight given to older sites in the search engines, the difference is probably not that significant. Also, there's not always much you can do about time beyond getting started with your site sooner than later. So if you are worried about an aging delay, I suggest you get started right away and move on to the next video. You don't need to know a lot before you begin this course, but you do need to understand a few things. Of course, you need to know how to get around on the web and how to use search engines. I don't have time to teach the very basics of working online. You'll need to understand how to use a web browser, how to load web pages, how to use the basic tools of the internet. I'm assuming most people who've made it this far do have these basic skills. More of an issue is web creation. This is not a course on creating web pages. I have to assume you know how to do that. However, there are many ways to create web pages these days. Writing HTML by hand, using an HTML editing tool such as Adobe's Dreamweaver or Coffee Cup Editor, or using a simplified site creation tool. Much of SEO has little to do with HTML, but we will be talking about HTML, hypertext markup language, the coding language of the web. You don't need to be an HTML expert, but you do need to understand a little. When I talk about the title tag, for instance, you need to have the ability to modify that text using whatever tool you're using. When I talk about H tags or the description tags, you need to be able to work on those tags either directly in the HTML or within whatever editing or site creation tool you're using. There are so many different ways to create web pages, hundreds of options, that I can't explain how to use each tool. Rather, I'll use HTML as the basic unit when we do talk about coding. And you'll need to figure out for yourself how to get to that particular item in whatever editing or page creation tool you use. So if you know how to use your page creation tool, you'll be fine. You may just need to do a little research to figure out how to edit particular HTML components. But I don't want to make all this sound complicated. Most SEO doesn't involve complicated coding issues. In fact, the most complicated coding piece is structured data markup, which we'll look at in a later video. And as useful as structured markup can be, it isn't essential to an SEO campaign in most cases. And in any case, it's not terribly difficult to deal with. So I don't want to scare you into thinking you can't manage SEO. All you need is some basic page creation skills. If you know how to use your page creation tool, you know enough to use this course. Before you begin an SEO campaign, you really need to understand the keywords you should be focusing on. You may think you know what those keywords are, but as you'll learn in this section of the course, you probably only have a partial understanding. There are quite likely some keywords you've missed and some you have on your list that are probably not very important. So in this section of the course, we're going to look at why keywords are so important, how to start building a keyword list, and how to do a keyword analysis in order to make sure you really do understand them and to discover how frequently they're used by real live searches. I'll also explain what you're going to do with these keywords. So let's get started learning this very fundamental concept, the very glue that holds your SEO work together. Why do we care about keywords? Because they're a channel to your prospects. Keywords represent a way to connect to the people you want to bring to your site in the same way that a storefront on a busy street helps retailers connect to potential clients. Retail stores want to have their windows on streets with a lot of traffic going by to enable them to reach people walking down that street. The shop windows enable the stores to connect with those people. In the same way, site owners need to use keywords to reach the people who are using those keywords in the search engines. The keywords allow sites 
to connect with users. This is a very simple concept, but one that many website owners really don't seem to get. Over more than a decade, I've helped literally hundreds of businesses, large and small, with SEO issues, and I've noticed several things related to keywords. Firstly, all too often, when I ask clients what their important keywords are, they don't know. Next, even if they think they do know, it often turns out that they're guessing. And even if they do know their keywords, I often have to ask why they think their website should come up in the search results for those keywords, because I see nothing on the site suggesting that it should. So here's the basic principle. You have a site and you want to bring people to that site. Those people go to the search engines and type in keywords. If you're lucky, when these people click search, your site comes up in the results. So you have to use the keywords those people are using. So an understanding of keywords is essential. If you don't know what keywords people are using, you can't connect with them. And if you don't use the keywords in the right way, you can't connect with them. So in this section of the course, we'll be looking at keywords in detail. It's the foundation of your SEO campaign, so you must get it right. We'll look at how to create an initial list of keywords and how to use that list to do a full keyword analysis in order to find out how often the words on your list are actually used by your potential customers and site visitors and to find other words that you missed. And of course, we'll be looking at how you'll be using these keywords. The first step to picking the keywords you need to use is brainstorming. You're going to manually put together a list of keywords you think might be useful. This won't be the final list you'll work with, it's just the beginning, something we can then base a proper keyword analysis on. So here are a few tips for building an initial list of keywords. First, start by writing down the obvious things. If you were someone your site was trying to reach, what keywords are you likely to enter into a search engine? Next, take a look at a few competing sites. You probably know who your competitors are. So load their sites, and then look around the site for the types of words they're using. You can also look at the source code. You can do this by right-clicking on the web page, and depending on the browser you're using, selecting View Page Source, View Source, or similar. In the three major browsers, Chrome, Firefox and Internet Explorer, you can also use Control-U. Then look for the Keywords meta tag. Search the page for the word Keywords. All three browsers use Control-F to open the search function. I'll be talking about the Keywords meta tag later in this course. It's actually not very useful, but many people still do use it. So you may or may not find the tag being used. You might find keywords in various other tags, though. Look at the description tag, title tag, and other meta tags that the webmaster may have employed to put keywords into the page. Now, take this list to your friends and colleagues. Show them the list and ask what they think you've forgotten. Reading the list may spark a few ideas. Next, look for obvious spelling mistakes. Certain words are misspelled very frequently. The word calendar and realtor, for instance, amateur, cemetery, jewellery, and so on. Now, the search engines recognize misspellings and often correct for them, and so targeting misspelled words is not as effective as it was a few years ago, but it's still worth knowing and using the misspelled versions. You can actually find lists of common misspellings online. Now look at the words on your list and think about synonyms. If you have the word home on your list, maybe you need the word house. If you have the word mortgage, maybe you need the word loan, and so on. Then consider split and merged words. A typical example is knowledge base. Is it one word or two? Different people spell it differently, so you'd want to use the term both ways on your site. How about overtime? One word or two. Starfish or starfish? One or two. This includes words that are often, but not always, hyphenated. In particular, e-words, email and e-commerce, for example. 
The search engines are pretty good at figuring all this out, but experiment. You'll find different search results for different forms of these words. With different forms of words, you'll want to know which are the most important, which terms are most commonly used. You'll put most focus on the more popular terms, of course. You'll see how to find out the frequency of searches in the next lecture. Next, singular and plural. Again, although the search engines know singular and plural forms of the same word are related, they still treat them slightly differently. So you need to know which term is more common. Is it book or books? Car or cars? The term books is searched far more often than book, for instance, perhaps 50% more. Don't forget to include geo-specific terms, the names of the towns your business provides services in, for example. And, of course, your company name in all the various formats. Finally, the names of competing companies and products. I won't get into this right now, but we'll probably post a lecture at some point related to legal issues involved in using keywords that are trademarked by competitors. It can be done in some situations, but can also get you into real problems in others. Still, it's good to know what people may be searching for. So, now you have a starting point, but you must not stop here. You may think you have the right keywords, but you almost certainly don't. Two things often happen when site owners stop at this point. Firstly, they miss important keywords. Secondly, they have keywords on their list that they think are important, but are really not. Plus, even if you have a perfect list, you still don't know the relative importance of your keywords. We'll be seeing in the next lecture how to find more keywords and how to find out what people are actually searching for and how often they're searching. I would suggest that at this point you get started on your initial keyword brainstorming. Create a text document or a spreadsheet containing your keywords. Once you've done that, come back here and move on to the next lecture. But don't scrimp. At some point you really should spend some time, probably at least an hour or two, thinking and learning about your keywords. I can't stress strongly enough that understanding your keywords is essential to your SEO strategy. Woody Allen said that 80% of success is turning up. Well, if you don't understand your keywords, you haven't turned up. So spend some time now working on your keywords to make sure your SEO campaign moves in the right direction. Your initial keyword list is merely a start. You need to take that list and do a proper keyword analysis using a free or commercial tool for several reasons. Firstly, you need to find the important keywords that you've missed. It almost always happens. What you think are the important keywords are often not, and your prospects, the people you're trying to get to your site, are using different terms. Don't think this won't happen to you, that you can just guess and get the words right. In my experience, that almost never happens. So in this lesson, we're going to look at keyword analysis tools, software services that can help you learn more about your keywords. These services actually analyze what people are searching for, tell you how often they search for each term, and suggest other terms you might want to add to your list. There are a number of these tools available, both free and commercial. As far as free goes, there are probably only two we really care about the Google and Bing tools provided as part of their pay-per-click advertising services. You'll need to set up PPC accounts to use these, but you don't need to spend any money to get to the tools. As far as commercial goes, there are a number of options available with advanced features, but you can often learn a lot using the free services, in particular Google. By the way, if you notice bad links in any lesson, please do let me know so I can fix them in these videos. You may also run into simple free services such as ubersuggest.org that use the search engine suggestions for keyword analysis. When you search at Google or Bing, the search engine looks at what you're typing and provides suggestions based on what other people are searching for. I don't believe these things are very helpful for a true keyword analysis, though they may be useful during the initial brainstorming phase. So let's start by taking a look at the Google tool, which is the most popular and probably the most useful of the free services. 
You'll need to sign up for an AdWords account if you don't already have one, but I'm not going to go into any detail about that. You don't need to actually set an ad campaign running or spend any money. Just go through the process far enough to where you can get to the management console. Once you're signed up, you'll open the Tools menu and select the Keyword Planner. Or if you're already signed into your Google account, you can use this URL to go there directly. We'll begin by clicking the first option, which opens up this form. You can enter a bunch of keywords in here. Now, you'll be spending some time with this tool. As I've mentioned before, keyword analysis is critical, so give yourself some time, don't rush it. So you can experiment with this system to find out what works for you. I'd suggest that you start with a single keyword or a small list to begin with. You can also enter a URL of a page on your site or a competitor site even, and Google will examine the page and decide what keywords it thinks are related to that page. I personally don't find that very useful. After all, if the page hasn't been well optimized, then the suggestions aren't going to be very good. You can also select product categories and Google will provide related terms. Remember, this tool is really designed for pay-per-click advertisers, so not all the functions are useful for us. Though again, you may want to experiment a little and see what you find useful. Next, set up the targeting properly. In particular, make sure the correct country and language is selected. The next three options, whether we're interested in keywords used on Google itself or Google and its search partners, negative keywords and keyword filters, are not very useful for our purposes. Again, these are more pay-per-click features. The keywords options can be helpful though, in particular the first and last. The first tells Google to only suggest keywords that are closely related to the keywords you have provided. You may want to experiment with this setting, but I would suggest that to begin with, you turn it on. As for the last item, the default setting is for Google to return sanitized keyword results, which is fine for most businesses, but some may need to turn adult terms on. The keywords to include setting can also be very useful. You can tell Google to only return keyword phrases that include terms that you provide. Finally, we have the date setting. Google will show us how often each keyword is searched for each month. And by default, it averages that over 12 months. You can modify that if you wish. You may want to do that if your business is seasonal in some way, for instance. Now, when you click Get Ideas, Google is going to grab the appropriate keywords and show you this screen. Let's forget the chart at the top. It shows the number of searches month by month for all the keywords in the tables below, which is usually not of use to us, especially as we don't yet know how many of the keywords are of interest. So we can click this little button here to get rid of the chart. Let's click on the Keyword Ideas tab. Now, the first thing we'll see are the keywords you entered. And for each one, we'll see the average monthly searches. How many times Google users searched for that specific keyword each month, averaged over the last 12 months, assuming you didn't change the date setting. We'll also see some pay-per-click information, an estimate of how competitive the term is, how much you would bid, and so on. But again, we're not interested in this PPC stuff. It's really how often people search for the keyword that counts. Why? Because you want to know which of your keywords people are using most often. Those are the ones that can potentially bring you most traffic. Below this list, Google will now show us terms that are related to the ones we entered, along with how often these terms are searched for. So this is where you're going to find the terms you've missed from your list. Now, back to the Add Group Ideas tab. In this area, we're getting essentially the same kind of information, keyword ideas, but they're grouped into related terms, which may help you dig through the suggestions. So, what now? Some of the suggested keywords are going to be useful, some are not. But we can take the list, drop them into a spreadsheet, and clean out the clutter. Click the Download button, download the data in Excel CSV format, and then open the list in Excel some other spreadsheet program, most will read Excel files, or if you don't have a spreadsheet program on your computer, you can save the data to Google Drive and open it there. 
Google will open this file in its Google Docs service. As you can see, you now have the list showing the keywords and how often they're searched for each month. You can delete the paper click elements if you wish. We can also delete the irrelevant terms. Then we can sort alphabetically and sort by search frequency. I know I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Spend some time digging through your keywords. Don't rush it. Learn what people are really searching for, and you'll be a step ahead of most of your competition. Once you have a keyword list, what are you going to do with this list? Well, that's what SEO is all about, of course. You're going to use those keywords in your web pages and in links pointing to your web pages. But which keywords? You may have a very large list of keywords, so there are a few basic things to consider, a few different strategies, different ways to use these keywords. The natural inclination is to focus on the most popular terms, the terms people are using the most. This is possible in some businesses, but if your business is very competitive, then it's hard to target these terms. For instance, if you're a mortgage broker, the chance of you ranking well for the term mortgage is next to zero. This is a hugely competitive area, with a number of companies spending enormous sums of money targeting primary terms such as mortgage and home loan. There are areas that are less competitive, of course. If your company sells rabbit hutches, you'll probably want to target the primary terms because the competition is so much less intense. In very competitive business, you may need to pick keywords with less competition and focus on those. I'll come back to that idea in a moment. What do I mean by targeting particular keywords? Whether the primary, most popular terms or secondary, less popular terms. I'll be explaining the specifics of how to use terms you're targeting later in this course, but let's say you plan to target the term rabbit hutch. You're going to be creating web pages that use that term and optimize the pages for that term. You'll use the term in pages URLs, in the title tags, in the H tags, the heading tags. You'll use the term in the body text within the page and you'll create links within your site on other pages pointing to that page. You'll put the keywords in the anchor text, the text in the link that is visible to people viewing your pages. You'll also want to create links on other sites pointing to that page, again using the keywords in the anchor text. You can also put the keywords in other places such as image alt attributes and image text, perhaps within bulleted lists using bold text, using italicized text and so on. I'll explain the specifics in later lessons. You can only really optimize a page for a single phrase at a time. There's only one title tag, only one URL, and so on. In some cases, the phrase you're optimizing for may actually be a combination. For instance, if you optimize for the phrase buy rabbit hutch, you're more or less also optimizing for the phrase rabbit hutch at the same time. However, even though you're focusing on one particular keyword phrase for a particular page, you'll want to mix in other related phrases. If you're focusing on rabbit hutch, you'll also include, spread around the page, terms such as buy rabbit hutch, rabbit hutch plans, indoor rabbit hutch, rabbit hutch for sale, bunny cage, and so on. So, whatever keywords you choose, You'll use those keywords in various ways, both on-page and off-page, to convince the search engines that your pages are good matches for those keywords. On-page optimization means things you do to your own pages. Off-page optimization essentially means creating links from other websites pointing to your site. Of course, you'll have more than one keyword you'll be working with, so one strategy you might use is to create a list and work your way down. In a non-competitive arena, you might simply sort the list with the most popular keywords at the top and work your way down the list, creating pages optimized for each keyword one by one. Perhaps this may be a long-term program. A small business might set a goal of creating one optimized page each day or several a week and work their way down the list doing one keyword phrase after another. 
For each page, they'll create some kind of quality, useful content that can, in effect, carry the keyword for which the page is being optimized. So what about if your business is very competitive? What do you do for, say, mortgages? Well, there are a couple of options. The first thing to consider is, if you're working in a limited geographic market, it might be possible for a mortgage broker to target a particular city, for instance. In some cases, in fact, targeting locally is essential. There's no point a real estate agent targeting the broad terms, such as real estate or buy home. They have to target people in their particular city anyway. This is something I'll be talking about later in the course. The other strategy is to go after what are known as long tail keywords. In any business, most searches are not actually for the most popular terms because there are many thousands of terms that, while they're infrequently searched for, in combination account for more searches than the most popular terms. So you back off the most popular terms and target terms lower down the popularity list. But I do want to be clear about one thing. SEO can be very easy in some cases, but extremely hard in others. There are some businesses that are hugely competitive, insurance, loans, and mortgages, uh, legal services, for instance. There are cases where success in SEO may be out of reach for many businesses, in particular small firms, or may at least require a very intense investment of time and money. Do you need content in your website? What does that mean? It means stuff, and by that I mean text. Sure, you can have images and video and animations and all sorts of other things. But from an SEO standpoint, at the end of the day, you need textual content, as I'll explain. So in this part of the course, we're going to look at the issue of how to get text into your site. I know many of you have heard the phrase, content is king. Well, I'm going to explain why that phrase is completely misleading. It's just not true. But I'm also going to explain why you still do need quality content and discuss a few different places you might find it and different ways you might create it. The good news is you may already have enough content. If you spent much time in SEO circles, you may have heard that your site must be an authority site in order to compete in the search engines. But not every website has to be or even can be an authority on a subject with world-class information. Continue to the lessons and I'll explain why. In this lesson, I want to very quickly make a single important point. Ideally, SEO starts before you build your site. It may be too late, of course. Perhaps you've had a site for a long time and are only now thinking about SEO. If so, that's the way it is. But I often run into potential clients who contact me looking for SEO consulting, but then say to me, we've only just begun building our site. We'll call you when we've finished. No, too late. As you'll learn in this course, there are important structural and architectural issues related to building a website that can have a huge impact on how well the site does in the search engines. You're going to find out how transport layer security may have an effect on search ranking, and the decision around whether to make your site mobile friendly is critical. As we progress through the course, you'll find out that there are important template and layout issues to be considered, such as whether you should format headings on your pages using pure CSS classes or with CSS modified H tags. You'll learn about structured data markup. We'll be discussing options for structuring your URLs and so on. You don't want to make these decisions twice. To make a bad decision first, then have to come back and fix it later. Certainly, anything on a website can be changed, but why not get it right to begin with? It'll save time and money to think about these things up front, rather than fixing them later after making the wrong decisions. Choosing a web hosting company is not easy. There are a lot of things to consider, from price to reliability, ease of use to feature sets and tools provided, and so on. Things that are really out of the scope of this course. But, from an SEO perspective, there are several important things to consider. Firstly, there's uptime. You need a hosting company that can deliver your pages virtually every time a browser requests the page. 
There's no such thing as perfection, of course, and most hosting companies do a pretty good job these days. But if your site is hosted by a company that's unreliable, with servers that often go down, your pages could be downgraded in the search results. Why? Because Google's overriding concern is providing useful search results to its users. If your site is frequently down, that won't provide what would be termed a good user experience. Having users click on dead links is not helpful. The other significant issue is how quickly the hosting company delivers the pages. Again, if pages are delivered slowly, there's a good chance your site will be downgraded in the search results. How do you find a reliable hosting company? That's tough. Perhaps from friends' recommendations or reviews from reputable sources. I would warn you, though, that some of the review sites you'll find online are scams. They review favorably the companies they get paid by. I would trust a hosting review from PC Magazine, for instance, but many no-name review sites I would not trust. One company you've likely never heard of that I would trust is Netcraft, which tests hosting companies and provides monthly rankings. The last time I picked a hosting company, I picked from the Netcraft list. What about if you already have a site and a hosting service? Well, you might want to test your site to make sure the host is doing a good job. There are many tools that can help you do this that will ping your site periodically and let you know when the site is down. Services such as Pingdom and Uptrends, and some have free services or free trials. The final thing to consider is that you won't want to host your site with a company that's in the business of hosting truly garbage sites, sites that the search engines would consider spammy. All hosts probably have some spam sites, and, and that's fine, it won't hurt you. So in most cases, with most hosting companies you're likely to run into, it's really not a problem. But if you know that a particular company focuses on providing low-cost hosting for companies in the drug or gambling areas, for instance, you'll probably want to stay away from it. You may already have a domain name for your website, and perhaps you already have a company name with a matching domain name. But if you're early in the process of building a site and haven't yet chosen a domain name, you should spend a few minutes thinking carefully about your choice. In fact, even if you do already have your domain name, I'd recommend you listen to this lesson because there are a variety of domain name problems you can encounter. I've seen a lot of mistakes with domain names, and in fact, there's no simple answer to what kind of domain name you should have. There are both SEO and branding issues involved. So in this lesson, I'm going to outline the different factors you should consider. We'll begin with the idea of putting keywords into domain names. Elsewhere in this course, I explain how important it is to have keywords in URLs. And of course, the domain name is the very first part of all the URLs in your website. So it seems obvious that domain names should have your primary keywords in them. And in fact, in the early days of SEO, it was very popular to register keyworded domain names like rabbit hutch shop or even rabbit dash hutch dash shop. These were known as exact match domains because the domain matched the keywords you were targeting. If you wanted to rank well when someone searched for buy rabbit hutch, you would register the domain name buy-rabbit-hutch.com. And in fact, having keywords in domain names absolutely did help with SEO. The search engine, seeing the keywords in the domain name, would give some weight to those keywords, so the site would get a bit of a boost. This probably doesn't help much, if at all, these days. It's one of the things that has evolved, and the search engines have given keywords in domain names less and less weight. However, there is still one way that having keywords in your domain name can help, and that's for linking purposes. We'll be looking at linking in detail later in this course. Suffice it to say right now that you need links and you need keywords in your links in order to rank well in the search engines. And the more competitive your area, the more companies you're competing against in the search ranks, the more good links you're going to need. Well, as you'll learn, you can't always get nicely keyworded links, even though that's your goal. One problem is that people placing links often place them on the name of the website rather than using the keywords you want in your links. So if you sell rabbit hutches and your company name is acmeboxes.com, you'll get lots and lots of links with the keyword acmeboxes in the link, which isn't very helpful. 
If you had a keyworded domain name, these domain name links would, of course, have to contain your keywords. So if the domain name was rabbithutchshop.com or rabbithutchstore.com, those domain name links will contain your keywords. How much does this help? It's hard to say, but I do believe it has an effect that it still helps with ranking. That doesn't mean you should always buy keyworded domains, though, because another issue is branding. Branding is a big subject in itself, but you need to understand that keyworded domains make really bad brand names. If you have the domain name rabbithutchstore.com, it simply isn't memorable. The very use of the keywords makes the name less memorable because it's now easy to confuse it with other keyworded domains. Is the name Rabbit Hutch Store, Rabbit Hutch Shop, Shop for Rabbit Hutch, Rabbit Hutches, Rabbit Hutch? Keyworded domain names are not memorable. In branding and in trademark law, there are different classes of company and product names. Fanciful, arbitrary, suggestive, descriptive, and generic. Fanciful terms are just made-up words like Starbucks, Avo, Kodak, Udemy, and eBay. They don't say what the business is. In fact, they really don't say anything much. They have no meaning except as a company name. Then there's arbitrary terms. These are real words or names, but they don't relate in any way to the company's activities. Words such as McDonald's, Subway, Apple, Amazon, Progressive, and even Fudge, which sells hair care products. Suggestive terms are close to describing the activity of the business, but with a twist of some kind, like Burger Barn, Travelocity, and Home Depot. Descriptive names are names that very closely describe the business, such as First Bank or Auction Web. And finally, there's generic, names that exactly describe the business, businesses such as Rent.com or Realtor.com and Books.com. If you name your burger joint Burger, that's a generic name. Generic names are terrible. They're very hard to protect legally and rarely do well in the public mind. A general rule is that good brand names are fanciful, arbitrary, or perhaps suggestive. Descriptive and generic terms are terrible brand names. Take a look at the Forbes list of the world's top brands, for instance, and you'll see that there are no generic terms and few, if any, descriptive terms. So that's all I'll say about branding. You'll have to decide on this for yourself, depending on the kind of business you're building. But let me explain a few other domain-related issues. Firstly, which TLD should you use? Which top-level domain? .com is a TLD, .net is a top-level domain, .org, .co, and so on. These are what are known as top-level domains. So, which do you use? Well, the first thing to consider is whether the top-level domain you want to use is a generic domain, sometimes called a GTLD, or if it's a country code top-level domain, a CCTLD. If you use a country code TLD, you're telling the search engines that your business is related to that country. If you use a .uk domain, such as rabbithutch.co.uk, you're telling the search engines that your firm does business in the United Kingdom. Use .jp, and you're saying that your business is in Japan. Use .us, and you're in the United States. That's not always a problem, of course, but if you sell internationally, it can be. If you don't want your domain to say, we do business just in this country, then you need a GTLD, a generic TLD. Here's a very specific example given by Matt Cutts of Google. If you have a .jp domain, it might be hard for your site to rank in, say, Finland. The generic TLDs are domains such as .com, .net, .org. In fact, Google assumes that if a TLD is not a country code, it's generic, and also includes .asia and .eu as generic TLDs. In fact, Google even has a list of country domains that have become so widely used for commercial purposes that it regards them as generic TLDs, what it calls generic CC TLDs, generic country code TLDs. Domains such as .tv, .co, .me, .nu, and so on. You can find that list here. So, picking the right top-level domain is important. 
If you're in the UK, for instance, but sell worldwide, you might not want to use the .co.uk domain, but a .com domain instead. But there's another top level domain issue, something I call domain confusion. This is based on people's normal bias for .com domains, especially in North America. People assume a domain name is .com, even if you tell them .net or .org, for instance. Years ago, I did a little consulting work for the Colorado Ballet, which had the domain name coloradoballet.org. I told them they needed to register the .com domain before someone else did. Within hours of registering it, we got emails from people saying there was something wrong with the ballet's website, because when they tried to load coloradoballet.com, they found themselves at a domain registrar. So clearly people were using the .com, even though Colorado Ballet had never owned or publicized it. Another example, while doing a link analysis for a client of mine, let's call them examplegadget.net, we found that 10% of the people trying to link to the site were accidentally typing .com instead of .net. What a shame to lose 10% of your hard-earned links. This is particularly a problem with the .net and .org domain names, probably less so with the new specialised domain names such as .trade and .shop. Now, the search engines don't really care which generic top-level domain you use. You won't get a boost because you use .com instead of .shop. They only care about the content of the site and the links to the site. But from a branding standpoint, the top-level domain choice is critical. There are plenty of .net brands that died while the .com brands survived, for instance. Finally, when registering domains, think about another form of domain confusion, the confusion caused by dashes, similar spellings, and plurals. Here's a classic example. I once had a friend who owned an ebook domain name, but I could never remember which one. Was it ebook.com, e-book.com, ebooks.com, e-books.com? I could never keep it straight. He actually sold the domain name eventually, and in fact, if you load these domains now, they go to three different websites. What a terrible brand name for all three companies. If I couldn't remember the domain name, and I worked with this guy, what hope is there for these companies' potential customers? Also, consider dashes. If you own, say, rabbithutchstore.com, you definitely should also own rabbit-hutch-store.com, before one of your competitors does. So that's a quick summary of domain name issues. Worth thinking about if you don't have one yet, and in fact, even if you do, you might want to take a quick look at any possible problems. Is your top level domain name going to hurt you when marketing internationally? Is your domain name likely to have domain confusion issues? Many of my clients have been able to register similar domains to avoid having somebody take a close domain name and in some cases have even changed their domain names. There are many ways to create websites these days. You can create web pages by hand, something that's rarely done these days. You can create web pages using simple HTML editors. You can use more sophisticated WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, editors. You can use blogging or content management systems such as WordPress, Drupal or Joomla. Or you can use site builders, simplified page creation systems, in effect, simple content management systems. Now, here's the problem. You need to be able to modify certain things in your web pages. You need control over the URLs, that is the file and folder names used in your site. You need to be able to modify the title tags, description meta tags, and perhaps keywords meta tags. Ideally, you need to be able to use H tags for headings in your pages and use structured data markup. And all these things need to be independent. You need to be able to have a title tag that is different from the H1 tag on the page, which is independent of the URL of the page. You also need to be able to create XML sitemaps. And you really need to be able to create mobile-friendly websites, something I'll explain in the next lecture. If you're creating HTML by hand, although I realize you're almost certainly not, or if you're using an HTML editor, then no problem. You have full access to the HTML and can do what you want. If you're using a sophisticated blogging system or a content management system such as WordPress, no problem. You either have direct access to the HTML 
or there are various plugins that you can install to help with your SEO work. The problem arises with some of the less sophisticated site builder systems. I'm not going to list or show any of these because I don't want to suggest which can or cannot manage SEO for you. There are so many options, there's no way for me to review them all. So here's what to look for. If the service provides a single, simple way to create web pages, a system that insulates users from the HTML, providing a simple web interface to create those pages, there may be a problem. In particular, if it's a company focusing purely on one type of business, lawyers or medical clinics or perhaps realtors, and if the company provides a simple content management system, it may not be able to do a good SEO job. I've seen many of these systems, even from large companies with thousands of clients, that are old and don't handle SEO issues very well. The only answer is to check before you buy. Don't just ask if the system handles SEO. You'll almost always get a strenuous yes answer. But ask the specifics. How do you get to the title tags, description tags, modify URLs, and so on? This is an important issue, and I've seen a lot of people very frustrated after selecting the wrong tool. So make sure you don't find yourself going down an SEO blind alley by making the wrong choice. In this lecture, we need to discuss TLS, Transport Layer Security, and Mobile Ready Sites. Let's begin with TLS, or SSL as many people know it, Secure Sockets Layer, though that's actually the older version that's been superseded by TLS. Without getting into too much geeky detail, Transport Layer Security is an encryption system that scrambles data being sent between your web browser and the server. When you connect to your bank or check out a shopping website, usually the connection is a TSL connection, and it certainly should be. You can tell when you have a secure connection a couple of ways. First, here's a non-secure connection. If you look at the URL in the location bar, you'll see that it begins with HTTP colon slash slash. HTTP means Hypertext Transfer Protocol, the essential communication protocol of the World Wide Web. Now let's look at Google. Google uses TLS for all communications with users. So whenever you search at Google, whenever Google sends you a page of search results, the data being transmitted is encrypted, scrambled. Yahoo does this too. You'll see that the URL uses HTTPS, the S meaning HTTP secure, or perhaps originally HTTP over SSL. You'll also see that there's a lock icon when on a secure connection. Over here on the left in Chrome, on the right in Firefox and Internet Explorer. So what's the big deal from an SEO perspective? Well, Google wants the entire web to go secure. The company believes that all transmissions across the web should use TLS. They should be encrypted. So in 2014, they began encouraging site owners to do this. And one thing they did was to begin giving a small boost in the search ranks to pages that are delivered over TLS. How do you use TLS? All you need to do is install what is most commonly known, ironically, as an SSL certificate sometimes as an SSL slash TLS certificate, and only occasionally as a TLS certificate. You should probably search for SSL certificate. The term SSL is so ingrained that few people understand that the security system is no longer SSL. For every person searching for a TLS certificate, more than 600 search for SSL certificate. These things cost from around $50 a year to several hundred dollars a year. Now, don't rush out and buy one right now. The boost to search results is probably pretty minor. However, the influence of TLS on search results is likely to increase over time. If I were running a major corporation site, I'd be switching over to TLS right away. If your situation is one of watching every penny, I wouldn't worry about it right now. I would think hard about mobile sites, though. A huge proportion of searches are now carried out from mobile devices. From laptops and tablets, of course, but more importantly from smartphones. Google looks at searches to figure out what kind of device they're coming from. And if the device is a small mobile device, generally a smartphone, 
Google will give higher weight to sites that are mobile friendly, sites that will display well on that device. Now, you're probably thinking, well, few people coming to my site are using mobile devices, it's okay, but you're almost certainly wrong. I have a heavy industry client who's what many would think of as unsophisticated computer illiterate customers. And yet, early in 2015, 29% of the traffic to their site came from smartphones. Other sites are reporting much higher figures and the numbers are rapidly increasing. So whatever business you're in, if your site isn't mobile friendly, it will not perform as well as it might for a significant portion of searches. And you're not just worried about Google. Bing began flagging sites as mobile friendly when delivering results to mobile devices and has begun using mobile friendliness as a ranking criteria in some cases. So, what is mobile friendly? There are three ways to make a site mobile friendly. Firstly, there's responsive design. This uses sophisticated HTML to automatically change the layout of a web page depending on what device it's displayed on. This is the most popular method to use these days, the most modern and the one recommended by Google. The second way is to use dynamic serving in which you have two versions of every web page and the web server sends out the most appropriate version each time, depending on the device requesting it. Finally, there's separate URLs. In effect, you have two versions of your website with different URLs for each page. Again, the server picks the most appropriate page to send each time. This isn't a course about web development, but these two links can help. The first provides information on the whole mobile issue, while the second provides a testing tool. You can enter a URL and see if the page that comes back is mobile friendly. Now, this may all seem very scary. All of a sudden, your web development project is getting much more complicated. But it just means you need to pick the right tool. WordPress, for instance, can work with responsive design themes. So if you are about to build a site, you really should seriously consider making sure you use a responsive design layout. If you have an old site, well, that's a much more difficult decision to make. Perhaps you can put off making changes now, but there's a good chance it could significantly impact your results over the long run.